When I look at the gleaming towers of downtown Los Angeles, I sometimes think of the immense, almost unimaginable wealth and power wielded by the handful who own these properties and populate their upper floors. The rise of these tower-dwelling titans represents both the overwhelming triumph of capitalism and, through the political influence purchased by their wealth, the capture, perhaps even the defeat, of democracy. Can any force oppose their power? I explored this question for two years, far below the skyscrapers of Los Angeles, as I documented 15 clashes in the never-ending battle between capital and labor. One day in January 2010, I received an invitation to attend a protest at the Hyatt Century Plaza Hotel in super wealthy Century City. Housekeepers, bellmen, and hotel food service workers belong to the Hospitality Workers Union, Unite Here, which has 275,000 members in the US and Canada. This was the first I'd ever heard of them. Their contract with Hyatt had expired two months before in November 2009, and they were going to raise some cane about it. 450 of the workers at the luxury hotel, including food and beverage, housekeeping and dishwashers, are part of Unite Here Local 11. To learn more about the reason for the protest, I spoke with hotel worker Ignacio Ruiz. I was able to send my kids to college, thanks to our union job that paid me good. Now we fear about our health benefits. The lawyer for the company drew a line, a straight line, which is amigo they are contributing right now. And, uh, we need uh, them to contribute at least another two dollars and sixty cents to stay with the same benefits that we got at this moment. Ruiz was emphatic on the vital role union membership plays in his working life. We are a family. Without a union, we will not have the respect that we got at the hotel. The protest continued as day turned to night. I bumped into Maria Elena Durazo, head of the LA County Federation of Labor and one of the highest profile labor leaders in the country. Without collective bargaining, there will never be any kind of a sharing of, of the wealth. And we don't mean all of it. We're not sure, talking about sure social. The wealth. What, what is this? <laughs> okay, we're not talking about everybody making the same uh, salary. We're talking about sharing the way the way it had been in the 50s and the 60s and partially in the 70s. When productivity was up, workers always shared in that productivity. The workers gathered for an address by AFL-CIO President Richard Trumka. I have a message from the 11 and a half million members of the AFL-CIO unions all across this country. We're with you in your struggle and we will stand with you and fight with you until we bring every hotel in Los Angeles to justice. Unions are a fundamental organization of workers to defend their common interests. Without unions, there were no child labor laws, there were no minimum wage laws, there was no such thing as an eight-hour day. A lot of the basic rights at work that we take for granted were won by the labor movement in this country. And uh, those have been eroded as union density and as union strength is also eroded. A couple weeks later, in February 2010, I got word about the union's other major campaign in nearby Anaheim. It seems Disneyland might not be the happiest place on earth, at least if you're a hotel worker. In front of Disneyland's Grand Californian Hotel, eight hotel employees were camped on the sidewalk and going without food for a week to draw attention to their two-year struggle for a new contract. We want to have affordable health care, and it's something that we've had in the past, and now Disney is trying to force us to go into their plan where we'd have to pay a lot more and we won't be able to afford it. I'm hoping that we touch a human core. Somewhere in there, somewhere within those people that make decisions up in, up in the corporate offices that decide what's going to happen to our health care. Because after all, it's, it's, it is literally a matter of life and death. Hello, si se puede, si se puede. At a closing rally, the hunger strikers were celebrated by members of civil society and then by their union's international president. How dare this company say that that person if she or he has a family, should pay more than one-fourth of his or her monthly earnings for health insurance. How dare they? Remember Disney managers. The workers are barely asking for crumbs from your rich table. They are the ones who make everything succeed for you. Will you deny them even that? When we go to school in this country, we don't learn history the way it really happens. In school we learn about famous people, important people, rich people.
But history is made by ordinary people. And what corporations too often forget is that they don't take care of the guests. They don't carry the bags, cook the food, serve the drinks, make the rooms, clean the floors. People that run these corporations, they don't do that. You do that. We'll write the history the way it should have been written. We'll put your names uh -huh. up right. front uh -huh. because you will make history do the right thing. As workers and allies thanked the hunger strikers for their sacrifice, I considered the story told by John Wilhelm, this alternative vision of history and its whole new set of heroes. I caught up with him at the Beverly Hilton Hotel. He wasted no time in describing what he saw as the main relationships in this American drama. The labor movement is very much on the decline in the United States and I think that's one of the reasons that our politics have become so reactionary. I don't think having a strong labor movement guarantees a progressive society, but I also don't think you can have a progressive society without having a strong labor movement. And uh, I think one of the reasons corporate America works so hard to, to uh, cripple unions is uh, so that they can uh, have their way uh, politically. In July of 2010, Disneyland hotel workers and their allies planned a mass action in the streets outside the resort. As the workers began marching, I noticed several of them dressed in Disney costumes, appropriating the power of myth, as if to symbolize the question of who is hero and who is villain in this struggle. To a contract and beyond, right Buzz? Outside Anaheim Convention Center, Aramark workers joined with the Disney workers in an immense river of mostly immigrant, low-wage labor. Disney wants to make health care unaffordable for about 2,000 low-wage workers. And uh, obviously, we're saying enough is enough. We've been saying enough is enough. But, but today is a sort of extra special day because these Aramark workers and the Anaheim other hotel workers here in Anaheim that have been fighting in solidarity, they've been fighting alongside these Disney workers for two and a half years, now their contracts are up. The union asserted that Disney's tactics had given a black eye to Anaheim, but the cardboard masks handed out to workers suggested they were willing to do the same in return. At the closing rally, the crowd was addressed by fellow hotel worker Lucy Arevalo. I wondered how billion-dollar companies like Disney and Hyatt could squeeze their workers so hard. Journalist Harold Meyerson offers an explanation. While the private sector in this country is unionized at a rate of a little over 40 percent in the mid-50s, uh, which is big enough so it affects pay rates all across the country, not just in the 40 percent, but it, it pretty much sets pay and benefit standards in much of the rest of the 60 percent. Uh, when it declines to 7 percent, it, it works the other way around. The pressure of the uh, non-unionized 93 percent and of workers in China and India and elsewhere battens down the wages of the, uh, of, of the remaining 7 percent of private sector workers who are unionized today. In July 2010, I received an invitation from Unite Here Local 11 to attend a red carpet event on Sunset Boulevard at the luxurious Hyatt Andaz Hotel. We're here uh, along with uh, uh, thousands of workers in 15 cities across the country. Uh, up to a thousand people are getting arrested in those cities to protest Hyatt's actions, uh, both in terms of uh, trying to take advantage of this economy, uh, this billion dollar corporation controlled by the Prisker family. They're also trying to deny non-union hotel workers uh, the right, the fair process to organize. At the appointed time, dozens of volunteers, Hyatt housekeepers and their civil society allies, stream off the sidewalk and into the middle of a blocked off Sunset Boulevard at rush hour. They take their positions on a red carpet in the street. Once again, people who live far outside the limelight are given the starring role. And what would a red carpet gala be without celebrity interviews? We have the Penny Pritzker! <laughs> Obama's Economic Recovery Committee. Did your company
company fire a hundred of its longtime housekeepers to replace them with substitute workers who make um eight dollars an hour? Yes, yes, it's true. But listen, listen, okay. Those women were making fifteen dollars an hour. That cuts into my profit margin. immediately disperse, which means to break up and leave this assembly. If you do not do so, you may be subjected to arrest. Nice. My camera. Is that the HD? Among those arrested is Maria Elena Durazo, head of the LA County Federation of Labor. The last one arrested, fittingly, is a hotel housekeeper. Next to the giant sheriff's deputy, she looks tiny, but as she's escorted away, she walks tall and makes a big impression. In all, 63 people are arrested in front of the Hyatt-Ondas that day. Unions that are, uh, that are flexible, that are creative, that are dynamic, and that focus energies and resources can win. But if you stage a creative action and the media don't cover it, does it even happen at all? In January 2011, I was the only journalist present for this inventive action in Hollywood staged by Disney workers. We're going to give Disney back their toys because they don't mean as much to us as they used to. Hopefully we'll prompt them to do the right thing, which is to not put all our families uh, in the jeopardy that they are doing. What's your name? And how old are you? What do you have there? What's that? It's a duck. It's a duck. It's Donald Duck. And what are you going to do with Donald Duck today? You're gonna throw it away? How come? What I don't understand is why one of the richest companies in the world is trying to cut such an important benefit just to save a few bucks. And who's going to pay the price? It's our kids. All our kids. I hope Disney hears my voice and will come around and do the right thing soon. Thank you. Bravo. Be nicer to our mom and dad. Yeah. Please share. Yeah. Anybody else? I do. You said something already. <laughs> Disney, Disney, stop the greed. I wondered if the lack of media covering this event might indicate something about the place of labor reporting in our nation's media landscape. There is no labor reporting in this country. None. You know, what happened to it? It went away with the union movement. You know, when I was a kid, every major newspaper had a labor report covering labor. Now everybody in this country works more than when I was a kid. When I was a kid, a lot of women didn't work. They raised children, for example. Now everybody works, but nobody thinks they actually labor. There's no labor reporting. There's nobody reports what they do and how they're treated. There's this gap in American consciousness, in American elite consciousness, not only on the treatment of workers, on the existence of workers. They're just not a subject. They're not there. On one hand, a long struggle would seem to offer a challenge to a union which has to present new, fresh angles on a labor conflict to maintain public attention. On the other hand, when a corporation is abusive enough, ideas keep suggesting themselves. There was a study that came out in 2010 in the, in the American Journal of Industrial Medicine that said that Hyatt has the highest injury rate of the 50 hotel chains that were studied. Down with the bosses! Those mean bosses! Those dirty bosses! Set up with the union! Set up with the workers! 
brothers fed up with the family. We've gathered here today to send a strong message to Hyatt. Stop sweeping housekeeper pain and injury under the rug. Next we hear from a Hyatt housekeeper, Margarita Ramos. Nosotras las de camareras, todo nuestro cuerpo nos duele. Si nos dicen, pónganse un círculo de un color en donde nos duele, nos vamos a llenar nuestro cuerpo de todos los círculos. Don't let this bullshit continue to occur. Las recamareras merecen respeto. También en estos hoteles existen personas que son gays, lesbianas, bisexuales y transgénero. Que por favor entendamos que todos, esta lucha es de todos y de todas. Unite Here was demonstrating flexibility, determination, and an impressively broad array of coalition partners. Could some unseen factor be holding them back? These are difficult times for the U.S. labor movement. Union density continues to fall. Uh, this is based on a number of factors. Um, largely, uh, it's due to changes in the U.S. economy, a huge transformation from a manufacturing-based economy to a service-based economy, uh, the impact of globalization, runaway shops, uh, but also some very hostile labor laws that have made it very difficult for unions to organize successfully. One such law, passed in Wisconsin by Governor Scott Walker, brought unions out in force in downtown L.A. in March 2011. I'm retired and I'm from Spokane, Washington. You came down from Spokane, Washington for Absolutely, this? Absolutely, yes. We got people here from Canada, from Montana. Workers marched from the L.A. Convention Center toward Pershing Square, pausing along the way to highlight local labor struggles. The first stop was at the Lux Hotel, where Unite Here International President John Wilhelm put that contract fight in context. Most of corporate America is doing like the Lux. Most of corporate America thinks they can roll back the very things that make our country great. Up to now, the biggest labor action I'd seen was the Black Eyed Mickey March at Disneyland, and this dwarfed that with an estimated 20,000 workers filling the streets. Wisconsin had lit the match, but there were anti-worker laws pending in over a dozen states at that very moment, and workers were rising up. The workers mass in Pershing Square, where they hear speeches from various labor figures, including Maria Elena Durazo, who speaks about freedom in a very different way than one hears from the American right. And the people of Wisconsin have shown us what it looks like to go all in when your democracy and your freedoms are on the line. The freedom to organize, the freedom to demand good wages and secure benefits, the freedom to collectively bargain. United we bargain, divided we beg. United we bargain, divided we beg. What brought people into the streets is a political problem, and Teamsters General President James Hoffa proposes a political solution. We have our numbers. We've got to energize. We've got to go out and get registered to vote. And you know what? Let's take these son of a bitches and vote them out of office and take back America. <laughs> The rally was called We Are One, and when I saw several people I recognized from Unite Here Labor Actions, I considered the meaning of that title. A sense of belonging comes from being part of something larger than oneself, and that feeling was evident here in abundance. This was an aspect of solidarity I had not understood until I experienced it. On April 4, 2011, I attended a rally at First AME Church in South Central Los Angeles, connecting the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King to the struggle of Wisconsin workers. Outside, I bumped into Disney hotel worker Jorge Nestra. It's all about solidarity. I mean, they might be in Wisconsin, but whatever happens over there affects us over here in California. Has there been any movement at all towards a contract with Disney? Well, the last move that we made as workers, as a union, uh, is we, me and a couple of other co-workers flew to Utah to confront the CEO, Bob Iger, at the annual shareholders meeting. 
Someone else I saw is L.A. City Councilman Paul Koritz. I'm out here because I'm a longtime uh, supporter of labor, and I don't like what I see going on in Wisconsin and elsewhere, and we've got to put up a fuss about it. I'm just an average voter, and I couldn't get a city councilman to show up at my barbecue, but gather a whole bunch of voters together, say, in a union, and suddenly, there he is. Inside the church, a packed house is addressed by numerous speakers, including Maria Elena Durazo, who points out Martin Luther King was a leader on labor issues as well as civil rights. And we're also here on the anniversary of our nation's tragic loss of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on April 4th, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee, where he was fighting for sanitation workers having the basic right to join a union. We think it is fitting to honor his legacy at a time when millions of workers are threatened with losing the basic right to collective bargaining. Reverend James Lawson, living legend of the civil rights movement, reaches further back in the American story to tap the power at the root of our national mythology. We must serve notice on our elected officials that we want them to stand for the same thing that we stand for. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created and equal in our interview, Unite Here International President John Wilhelm referenced another key moment in American history to illuminate the present day. What, after all, was the New Deal and Franklin Delano Roosevelt? It was. Uh, 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 the creation of checks and balances on corporate America because corporate America had gone overboard and created the Great Depression. Well, here we are again. Only 7% of uh, workers in pr the private sector are in unions, and that continues to shrink. Now, some of that is the fault of the labor movement. We have to also look at what's wrong with our institutions. But it is the result also of a concerted program to weaken the single most effective check and balance on corporate America. Another check against corporate power might be a citizenry educated enough to know when it's being manipulated and which can vote in its own interest. Students from CSUN are shown here at an April 2011 rally to restore the CSU system whose pro-democracy, anti-poverty mission has collapsed as fees have risen 313% in the past 10 years and 4,000 faculty members have been cut in the past five years. Although the California education crisis deepens each year, attendance at the rallies has rapidly declined. In March 2010, thousands of students turned out. The 2011 rally shown here was a fraction that size, and a March 2012 rally at Cal State Northridge was canceled due to lack of student interest. Does the Hospitality Workers Union fare any better under the fatigue of a long campaign? In July of 2011, a year after the red carpet arrests, I was back at the Hyatt on Dawes in West Hollywood. Here's Hyatt housekeeper Linda Lopez. No nos escuchan cuando les decimos que, por ejemplo, es demasiado trabajo, no podemos terminar de limpiar los cuartos, y si está el hotel todo lleno, sobrevendido, no, no nos respetan. Ellos no quieren saber de eso, solo quieren cuartos limpios. So why, what is it that makes the injury rates higher here than anywhere else? Hyatt has worked uh, harder at uh, pushing housekeepers to do more work. In a, non, in a typical non-union Hyatt hotel, housekeepers have to do between 25 and 30 rooms a day. Now think about that. Depending on whether there's one bed or two in the room, that's somewhere between 25 and 40 beds. It's cleaning the rest of the room, it's scrubbing 25 to 30 bathrooms in, a, in an eight-hour day. It's, it's uh, humanly impossible. It breaks people's bodies down. In a typical union hotel, housekeepers do 14 or 15 or 16 rooms a day. It's still a lot of work, but it's nothing like uh, what they're faced with in non-union hotels. When the signal is given, workers and their allies pour once again into Sunset Boulevard. Instead of a red carpet gala with an actress playing a billionaire Hyatt owner, this year the housekeepers themselves take center stage. Marta Pacheco, a Hyatt Century Plaza housekeeper for 17 years, rushes to get the work done. Surgeries for carpal tunnel have twice made Marta unable to work. The co-workers, like Linda Lopez, keep at the growing work. 
The lack of fitted sheets, the constant bending and lifting takes a toll and can cause many housekeepers to hurt their lower backs and arms. Housekeepers move so quickly to get their work done, they often miss and if an extra towel or sheet has fallen on the floor. Housekeepers can seriously hurt themselves. At times requiring major surgery from tripping on linens or other hotel amenities strewn around hotel rooms. Housekeepers, you are not alone! We will not be silent! We will not be silent! We will not be silent! If the strain of a long fight was getting to them, it wasn't obvious. Still, I asked President Wilhelm, is it distaste for drawn-out conflicts like the Hyatt and Disney campaigns that keeps 93% of private sector workers from joining unions? Well, the problem is not that the 93% of workers are not in the union don't want to be in the union. That's not the problem. And there's ample polling data that show that, that a substantial majority of non-supervisory American workers would rather have a union. That's not the problem. The problem is that our labor laws are so bad and so unenforceable that there is, as a practical matter, no legal right to organize a union in this country. It is, it, the only way to organize a union in this country is to engage in enormous struggle. Enormous struggle. In September 2011, United Here staged a week-long, round-the-clock strike at the Hyatt Andaz. Nerves were on the jagged edge. We're on strike at Hyatt because of all the hotel chains. Hyatt is absolutely the worst. Their workload should be human, not made to destroy people and hurt people and then turn them out and bring in new people. No. workers are making a huge sacrifice, um, losing their wages for a whole week. As it is, they live on the edge, but they're willing to make that sacrifice because it's been two years, almost two years, that uh, we've been without a contract, and of all the hotel chains, Hyatt is by far the most abusive. Well, well, with the bill, shouldn't you be inside running the hotel? When you use flat sheets, it leads to more repetitive motion injuries. Right. Hyatt Corporation has opposed the use of fitted sheets because they say it would take too much money to start supplying the hotel with fitted sheets. As vacationers, it doesn't matter to you whether you have fit or flat sheets. You can be cut up. That's right. If it helps the workers, we want fitted sheets as well. Some hotel guests saw things quite differently. Why? What is over the top of that? Yeah. It's over the top, right? It's been a bit And we've got a we to be here. And we're sitting out there listening to this crap all night. So, and that's Hyatt's nah, that's fault, cool. not theirs. Oh, yeah. It's not paid for by me, it's a company. <laughs> as they come in and out. They... Well, I mean, look, this is there's a strike here and, and it's important that people respect the picket line and I think we've really lost our, our cultural understanding of what it means to go on strike and so I think people, some people don't even know. So we just ask them, you know, please don't cross the picket line, there's a strike going on, please respect the boycott of this hotel. You know, um, And if we think the unionized workers who are on strike right now have it bad, think about the non-union hired workers in San Antonio, in Santa Clara, in Indianapolis, and in Long Beach. I went inside the hotel where management issued me the following statement. 
They wish the union leaders had settled their contracts so the associates could be spared a work stoppage that has nothing to do with their wages and benefits. Hi, it's right that this isn't about wages and benefits. Workers want the right to be able to picket strike or boycott on behalf of other workers who are fighting to organize. Sixteen point five percent of workers in Los Angeles are unionized, well above the national figure. I wondered how immigrant workers like these fit into the overall puzzle. The fact that California is now regarded rightly as a blue state, a solidly democratic state, that is really uh, in part simply because of this demographic transformation that the labor movement in LA uh, was able to politicize. If you look at who's 18 years of age and younger today in America, it is substantially non-white and it's substantially immigrant. And uh, it is the history of our country that we have been successfully revitalized and re-energized and made more progressive by waves of immigrants. And that's about to happen again, in my view. And I think that's all for the good. We are very um, enthusiastic about the change in the position of labor towards immigrant workers. Uh, historically, employers have always used race, gender, and immigration status to divide workers. No one is coming north from Mexico to lower American wages. No one is coming north to break unions. The only solution to this, since you can't wall off the world, is you have to have a union movement here. You have to have a world where new labor can't lower wages. It has to be paid decent wages. Later that month, I heard from the Disney workers again at an event they held at the St. Anselm Episcopal Church in Santa Ana. The workers of Unite Here Local 11 at the three Disneyland hotels have been fighting for three and a half years to hold on to their place in, in the middle class by holding on to middle class jobs at Disney. A starting housekeeper at Disney makes as little as $9 an hour. Housekeepers with years of service with Disney make as little as $11 an hour. So you can see with those wages, a $500 a month premium for family health care is impossible. What I'm looking at is maybe possibly this Christmas losing my full time and losing my seniority. And we will, if I lose it, where my seniority is, everybody in all three hotels will lose their seniority. And Disney will be able to schedule us however they want. And with that, I can tell you for me personally, and uh, I will have to, I'll lose my house. Sisters and brothers, this is not about a bad economy. This is not about a recession. This is about now, about corporations that make far, far too much money, are far, far so, so big and so profitable that they'll step on the least of us and they'll step on those of us who are used to a middle class standard of living. We have to stop them. And I speak on behalf of the American Muslim community. We will be behind you until we succeed, because your success is our success. We're going to continue fighting them until we win a fair contract for Disney workers. Thank you. I heard weariness in the voices that night, even despair. How much longer could Unite Here hold out? And did unions everywhere face this choice between capitulation and endless conflict? The U.S. labor management relationship is a particularly contentious one. In Western Europe, there are other paths that they have taken which has respected the role of unions. Only in America have inequality risen to this level and have wages gone down so much, even though Europe is just as much affected by globalization and uh, the automation that comes with technology as we are. So something else is different here, and the difference here is uh, the shift in balance in class power has been greater here. And that manifests itself first in the declining level of unionization, and then secondly, in the declining ability of unions to mobilize voters at election time because they're smaller. The U.S., Europe, globalization, income inequality, union density, politics, labor law, social welfare policy, there was a dizzying array of factors in play. I spent a considerable amount of time at the library, combing through books and journal articles, nailing down facts and unearthing connections. As unionization rises, inequality shrinks. But as unions decline in power, income inequality grows. Private sector unionization in the U.S. is at its lowest rate in over a century. And among the world's advanced economies, for income inequality, the U.S. ranks second. 
If this relationship holds, then the most unionized country would probably be among the most equal countries. As it happens, the most unionized nation on Earth is also the most equal nation on Earth. They call this magical, mythical land Sweden. Sweden, the hospitality industry is highly organized, and those unions are great, and they've been very supportive of some of our struggles. In the 60s and 70s and early 80s, the LA Times, which at that point was lavishing money on editorial and on stories, had a great labor reporter named Harry Bernstein. They sent him to Sweden, and he did a series of stories on Swedish unions and Swedish social democracy. Not just a series, he did 12 long stories in the LA Times about this. This is like, you know, talking about the planet Mars today. It is inconceivable that this would occur to an editor today. You know, this would not happen. I think that's a great idea. If nobody else is doing it, I guess it's up to me. My goal was to meet as many people as I could and come back with a fuller understanding of how unions fit into the big picture. I traveled from Los Angeles to Gotland, an island in the Black Sea off the coast of Sweden. There in the medieval town of Visby, I attended Politicians Week, an annual gathering of elected officials, labor leaders, workers, students, and civil society figures from across the political spectrum. Each of Sweden's eight political parties had its day in the sun, and tens of thousands of people attended over 1,500 seminars, where people from far left to extreme right discussed politics in a cordial, respectful way. I'd never seen anything like it. This is Prime Minister Friedrich Reinfeldt giving the keynote address when it was the moderate party's day in the spotlight. Uh, this is the extreme example of how Swedish civil society is organized. It's very open, very accessible. You can bump into a member of parliament, you can bump into a, you know, a cabinet secretary on the street, um, ra raise your issue. It's very, it's sort of the essence of Swedish civil society. Everybody is here, from, from the prime minister down. You can meet anyone all over the streets and you can go right up to them and talk to them. And it's it's not like that in the United States at all? No, it's not. Really. Here is freedom, you don't have freedom. You call it freedom, but it's not freedom at all. This is freedom. After being schooled by the professor, I sat down with Mikael Nielsen, a national officer of the world's strongest labor organization. ELO is a confederation, uh, the biggest one in Sweden. Uh, we have 1.6 million members and um, we organize 14 affiliated uh, trade unions, uh, the blue color workers. Just so you can get a picture of Sweden, we have in the labor market we have uh, 4.5, 4.6 4, 4. Uh, million uh, workers in Sweden and 71% uh, of them uh, belongs to a trade union. Uh, actually for 20 years ago we organized 85% of the Swedish workers. The blue for more on labor fundamentals, I talked with Mats Essemiel, research officer for TCO, the White Collar Union Confederation, which Mats introduced as... We're the strongest uh, white collar trade union uh, in the world. Very important to understand why trade unions are so strong and so powerful and why they are so many because we have the system of collective agreement in our hands. To understand the importance of these collective agreements, some historical context is required. The crucial moment came in 1938 with the signing of the Salzjobaden Accord, Johann Sundquist explains. Well, so you had the employers, you had the unions, and you had the government. These three parts uh, came together and, and you know, forced an agreement on how, how the Swedish system would work. That, you know, uh, regulating how, who talks to who and what issues, and how far you ha push the talks before you go into strike, and all these things. So, when you had that agreement, you had a very, 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 very stable base to, to, move, to build on. Because you knew that none of the parts was going to do anything without including the other parts. But we also had a very, very large advantage of coming out of the Second World War basically untouched. We had a, a perfectly functioning industrial production. We ran out, we came out of the Second World War running. So that gave us a lot of space for improvement. But so much has changed since World War II. How does Swedish labor adapt to the transformations of the globalized economy? Mats Essemiel of TCO explains two crucial factors. We are happy to see 
jobs go if they are low wage simple jobs they can go to other countries provided that new jobs with more complicated more value added higher wages are established so this is our way of transforming the society trade unions are a part of this restructuring process then of course the welfare system that provides safety for people that becoming unemployed ill or having children is essential if the high, if the safety system the welfare system wasn't at the place then we in the trade union would have been much more re reluctant to let jobs go Welfare systems are established by law, another example of the role politics has in shaping workers' lives. Just how central is politics to Sweden's strongest unions? We have always uh, been quite uh, heavy on uh, ideology. Political thinking is, is a part of the labor movement, as, as you've seen here. The, we have uh, a strong political side of, of, of the blue-collar workers' unions in Sweden. It was clear I needed to understand who the players are, but Sweden's political parties are named in a way that's anything but clear. In Sweden, you know that. Have you, you know the, the political spectra goes from you know, uh, conservative on the right wing to liberal, that is also on the right wing, to uh, Green Party that's in the middle, and then you have Social Democrats, and then you have the left. So it's not at all. It's not a polemic between you know conservative and, and liberal, because liberal in, in Sweden means right wing, but not as right wing as conservatives. So you're saying that <laughs> our left is your right? Uh, I, I would say that your left is probably our sort of yeah, center right. In other words, there's a much larger space on the political left in Sweden than in the U.S. I caught up with Wanya Lundby Wedin, the world's most powerful labor leader. She also spoke about the vital role of the political process, the goals it can be used to reach. She used terms almost unheard of in American discourse. It's so important for our members if we really are to reach full employment for both men and women. We need to have politicians that really, that really uh, create what we call the welfare society. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the child care, the, the uh, uh, transports, public transports, the housing and all, all that. It sounds like so you're talking about social and economic justice. Yeah, it is. About, it is it's really about that. We, we, we have strive for equality, for, for, for a society with, with equality, justice and, 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 and solidarity as, as, as a goal for, for, for the, the Swedish labor movement. I mean, we call, we call it the Swedish labor movement, but then we mean the, the ELO, the trade unions and, and the Social Democratic Party. For more on the accomplishments of this alliance and who opposes it, I spoke with LO Vice President Ulla Lindqvist. We have built day nurseries so both men and women can work and have their children at day nurseries. The, the welfare system, when we have a, a general insurance, and all this we have built together in the, the, the trade unions and the Social Democratic Party together. And all the time, the, the right wing parties has been against it. Uh, especially what we today call the, the moderates, they were called the righteous uh, before. They gave themselves a new name to sound a bit more yeah, attractive? Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Now, they call, now they call them the new moderates. The, and they say that they are a working party, but they are not, not at all. They don't have that politics. So, so, so we have built the whole societies to, to be good for the workers. Uh, uh, that, that we have managed because we have this cooperation with the Social Democratic Party. My name is Mikael Bogsjö. I am a regional officer for the Social Democratic Party in, in the south of Sweden. We are a, a left party. Uh, and the name indicates what, um, what spectra we have. Social democracy. So um, we are mainly um, defending the interests of the workers. Social democracy? That sounds suspiciously like socialism, which the American right tells me to fear and despise. I asked Andreas Johansson, a baker and a member of the Food Workers Union, how he could choose to be something so horrible as a socialist.
To be, to be a socialist, to be a member of the trade union is um, it's, it's from a self-interest. Because if, if, we, um, if we approve of homelessness, if we, if, okay, it's okay for some people to be homeless. It, there is a, it, there's a chance, but maybe small, that I become homeless. But if we say we don't allow homelessness, there's no chance of me being homeless, is it? And if we take care of the sick, um, when I get sick, someone will take care of me. So I will never be alone. That didn't sound so terrible. I attended the keynote address by Håkan Juholt, then head of the Social Democratic Party. It's the largest single party in Sweden, though it's presently out of power. Juholt spoke of renationalizing railroads, renationalizing pharmacies, and he said every person has a right, not just to a job, but to a part-time job so they can spend more time with their families. I asked Andreas just how deeply rooted is this connection between the blue-collar unions and the Social Democrats. The LO, or uh, the part of the trade union we, uh, we're a member of, we founded a political party, the Social Democrats. Yeah. Uh, the, the trade union was first. And we got a lot of... Um... The union founded the political yeah. party to do its will. Yes. Yeah. This happened in 1889. Forty years later, after the coming of democracy, the Social Democrats swept to power in 1932. When the workers came to, to political dominance yeah. and they voted their interests, mm -hmm. what did they want? And they wanted health care, they wanted uh, conditions at work, uh, they wanted eight hours work <laughs> a day, uh, 40 hours a week. They've been fighting for this uh, since they formed the trade unions, but now they have the possibility to, to make it a law, uh, and so they did. Uh, and they did. They got. Yeah. They got what they wanted. Yeah, they got what they wanted. And Sweden ended up with the most uh, generous welfare state benefits yeah. in the world. Yeah. Uh, did those benefit just the workers? No, no, no. That's for all. All people. So, uh, are you suggesting that uh, powerful labor unions benefit everyone? Yeah, they do. However. The Social Democrats have been out of power since 2006. I asked union officials and workers how this change in government affected them. This new uh, leadership in the uh, liberal and conservative uh, uh, government, uh, the right-wing government, they say they like the collective agreement, they say they like the Swedish model, uh, they say they like the social dialogue, but uh, in practical uh, politics, they do exactly the opposite. They decided that it was no longer tax deductible to be a member of the union, so the membership fees rise from like 80 crowns to 200, 300 crowns, which is a lot of money. I thought uh, conservative governments wanted l lower taxes. They, they lower the taxes, but they increase membership fees so that everyone will leave the unions, because they don't like workers. How did they, how did they sell that to the public? What did they say that was going to do? They didn't just say, we're going to come in and bust the unions, did they? No. My name is Ella Nia, president of the Swedish Hotel and Restaurant Workers Union. How many members do you have? We have about uh, 33,000 now. Some years ago we were about 55,000. And uh, I think the one, um, one thing that we lost quite many members was the changes made by the conservative government about the unemployment insurance system. They had a brilliant plan uh, when they won the election in 2006 to uh, we have an unemployment benefit rate of uh, about 80 percent of, of your former salary and um, in 2006 they decided that a, a bigger part of that should be paid by the workers themselves and that uh, fee is taken in by trade unions so my my trade union the industry workers union the metal workers union uh, in 2007, we had to pay a bill of uh, 170 million dollars more than 2006. And uh, the only uh, we can send the bill to is, of course, our Your members. members. Yeah, so we had to raise uh, every month uh, for every individual member with about 50 dollars. So, uh, yes, of course, we lost a lot of members. That was their plan, and it succeeded. So. Uh, the, the TUC, or the, the Blue Collar Workers Union, have lost about 300,000 members uh, since 2006. That's, so, that's dramatic. It's dramatic, yes. 
For a dramatically different interpretation of the Union's recent turn for the worse, I went to the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise, the major business organization in Sweden, where I spoke with economist Lee Janssen. If organizations fail to be rele relevant for their members, then they will lose members. And it's an open question whether the unions have managed to be relevant in a modern economy uh, with modern solutions for, for, for the working people of today and for the young people. And the, the numbers suggest that they, they have some kind of problem. Are there any disadvantages to being so closely wedded if the Social Democrats are out of power? Does the Labour have nowhere else to turn? Yeah, in some way, that's that's maybe the 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 backside of the the cooperation with the, the with the Social Democratic Party, because no, maybe the left party and maybe the Green Party, but none of the uh, the right wing party want to want to cooperate uh, with uh, with the LO. Uh, so we have to not force them to, but but we have to put sticks in the wheel for them. At night I slept a half hour's walk outside the city walls on the floor of a high school classroom. Down the hall were students from the Green Party Youth Organization, and this seemed an appropriate time to inquire into Sweden's education system. Not you don't have to pay for the education and you get like two and a half thousand every month. You like, don't have any to like, do And that's not, you don't that's have to pay that back. No. 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 Pay back and but you if, you, make, if like, your life costs more, if it costs more to live where you live... Yeah. And you can get 5,000 guaranteed as a loan each month. Oh, this sounds really good. Kroner, so. <laughs> it is yeah. really good. I'm trying to sell Sweden to you. <laughs> <laughs> For clarification, I sought out the Swedish Students' Union. Yes, they also have a union, 100,000 strong. It's part of SACO, the third major labor federation. In Sweden we have a very good system for studying, who makes it it makes it possible for people coming from every every level of the society, even even if you don't have these very rich parents, you have uh, you have enough money to to go to school. So we have a system that gives you money from the government from the fir from when you go to high school until you reach your PhD level. From high school, yeah. The pay begins at high school. We look upon higher education as an investment from the society to the population. So to An the... investment should be carried by the whole society, because it, the whole society will benefit from this. Alongside the formal education system for the last hundred years, there has been a network of seminars, study circles and other events sponsored by trade unions through their Workers' Education Association, or ABF, which, as ABF President Karl Petter Torvaldsen explains, has been empowering workers since before the arrival of democracy with astonishing results. At that time it was political economy, how to uh, rule a municipality, how to take uh, place in parliament, etc. We had education about that. So is this because when, when the system opened up, all of a sudden common people or oh, yeah. workers could, oh, yeah. could be part of the and parliament? They did. We have uh, the, the best uh, representation of ordinary workers in parliaments and, and, and committees all, all over the world. So in Sweden, democracy is uh, it's really... Um, ordinary people's business. It's so even after over oh, yeah. over 90 years oh, later, yeah. the, it hasn't become strictly professionalized. Oh no. Oh, no. So, uh, for instance, uh, Blue Collar Workers Union, we have about half the places of the Social Democrats in Parliament. So uh, 60 out of 130 belongs to the union. So we are still, we have a lot of influence in, in society. Aren't running campaigns very expensive? How do the, how do no, the common it, people it, get it, into no, government? No, it's not expensive in Sweden. Uh, you know, this is not America at all. But are today's students turning out to vote? To discuss turnout for the last national election in 2010, here's Johan Sundqvist. By Swedish standards, the election, you know, the the elective rate, I mean, the number of people going to the ballots was very low. I mean, we were down at, I don't know, 79% or something like that. By world standards, it's very high. By, I know, by American standards, it's amazing. <laughs> but by, by Swedish standards, that was a tragedy. And, and when, when few people vote, the Social Democratic Party loses out. Because the people that tend to not go to vote are marginalized, marginalized people, young people, unemployed people, the people that, you know, support the social welfare system and the Social Democratic Party. Back at the high school, an even more startling difference between the Swedish and American political systems was revealed when I asked Green Youth member Lovisa Sangnell how Swedes register to vote. Uh, when you're 18, you're allowed to vote, and then either you do it or you don't. 
Yeah. You don't have to register anywhere. You don't have to go to the Department of Motor Vehicles or the post office and say, hi, I would like to vote, so please no. give me a paper to sign up. No, not, not that I know. That's interesting you mentioning it because I've never really thought of it. Since we, we are a democratic country, it's, well, it's custom that everybody gets a vote. It's not like that in the States. It's not? How is no. that democratic? It's not. It's not. No. Sorry. I, I was thinking, am I naive now? But I'm not. No. Because everybody gets to vote if they're 18. If it's a democracy. Yes. Yeah. And, and we are. One of the most pressing concerns for Swedish unions is declining membership among young workers. Mats Esamil from the White Collar Union Confederation suggests some reasons for the decline. Trade unions are connected to concepts like old, old-fashioned, old male, uh, complicated instruments, difficult words. Trade unionism are boring, not funny, it's boring in the eyes of young people. And do you feel a pressure to make yourself funny and entertaining in order to appeal to youngsters? Absolutely, and I am trying to be very entertaining and very funny. And that, that, is, uh, uh, that is not difficult for me because I'm a very, very funny guy. I find you quite entertaining, yeah. yes. So, so you're working on that, that's yes, going well. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> I work like a half time on Facebook and Twitter and making my voice heard. And, and do you feel people respond to you yeah. there? You can meet them there? Of course, and through uh, my blog and the, the website, the LO Young website, yeah. That's, without that, we would be like dead. <laughs> You're talking about being an old organization, 100 years old. Uh, but that, that first hundred years, especially the middle part, your organization was extremely successful. Yep. Do people forget that that came from you? Do yeah. they, they don't remember? Nope. So you and your political allies, the workers and their allies, built the world's most generous social welfare system yeah. and people forgot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those universal benefits that everybody has in Sweden, where do those come from? Um, I guess they were from. I don't know. We had them for so long. Yeah. I can't remember. I guess it was the social, social democrats. Yeah. But I don't know. It's, I, I I don't know. I, I don't know really. People don't understand really where the money and the benefit system comes from, and they see it is right that they can claim from the stage, and they don't connect it with the people that pays for it actually are uh, the other persons in the, in the closed society. Left and right agree that collective amnesia is eroding public knowledge of Swedish labor's achievements. A nation's media system both records the national memory and sets the agenda for public debate. Inside a noisy restaurant, I spoke with Eric Sundström, a leading journalist of the left, about the role of Sweden's media in shaping public consciousness. The media landscape is tilted I think it's fair to say towards the right. We used to have much stronger newspapers in most of the cities in Sweden that were Wigley, Social Democrat, Centre Left. Quite a few of them uh, passed away, unfortunately, in the 80s due to they didn't really make ends meet and you have had problems with newspapers uh, dying even before the crisis we have now. So many Swedes wake up only with a leading conservative daily or some local conservative newspaper. Today, the media situation in Sweden is that, well, 80-90% is controlled by, by the conservatives. So, <clears throat> so of course, that situation is, is hard for us. We have to build our own again, because we lost it somewhere around the 70s. Do you think that has something to do with why they're in a, in a relatively powerful position and your position is, is less powerful than it was? Yeah. Because of the media putting out the story? Yeah, I think so. And what we also have in Sweden is a subsidy actually, a state subsidy normally for the second biggest newspaper in a town. So you can get money just so you have the, the plural situation. But we can see that is going away more and more and we have a few big companies owning most of the newspapers and those companies are mostly to the to the right. So that's a problem for, for Labour. The Social Democrats just got lazy and didn't keep up with that. Uh, and, that's, and that shows now in, in, like, in how the media reflects uh, uh, public life. 
Could a pervasive, one-sided media culture even shape the understanding of those who do know how modern Sweden came about? In Sweden, the unions don't have as much... The, we, we are kind of in a post-union society, I would say. Yeah. You must disagree if you don't, if you don't agree. Uh, the, agree. The unions have kind of played most of their part. They have risen this welfare state. They have done their work. What do you say to that? I think it's bullshit. <laughs> because the union is needed more than ever now, I think. As I pondered this generational divide, I couldn't help but notice the tension between what I'd heard about the crushing burden of Sweden's extremely high taxes and what I was seeing around me. Uh, we look here in the harbor and we can see that there's the, quite a few lovely boats and this is a, a, a beautiful atmosphere. It appears that there is the opportunity to, to amass a fortune does exist. It's not that everyone wears gray sackcloth and lives a miserable Stalinist lifestyle here. No, uh, definitely not. I mean, you, you, can, you can live a good life in Sweden. What kind of income tax does uh, a, a working person pay or a wealthy about, person pay about here? About 30%. A working class person pays 30% in income yes, taxes? Yes. And what about if, if you're a wealthy person? What would you pay, you think? A wealthy person uh, pays 50% uh, if it's uh, a real uh, rich person. At the top level? Yes. What would a, a, uh, an entrepreneur or successful person here expect to pay in, in uh, income taxes? 74% tax is the highest marginal tax, but the most is about 60-65%. The man on the left was a little low, and the woman on the right was a little high. According to the Heritage Foundation, Sweden's top income tax rate in 2012 is 57%, compared to a top U.S. rate of 35%. And for for working people? That depends on how much your, your salary are, but the the. the uh, level of tax that most people pay is 32%, but then you don't see the hidden taxes, which is the double, so then it's 64. I'd never heard anything like that before. The double, what do you mean? We have uh, hidden taxes with the employer's uh, social contribution, which is also 30%. Uh, oh, that comes out of the pay before the worker ever sees it. Yes, exactly. I'm not so sure it's fair to count her double. However, I do think it's fair to compare unearned investment income, which is how rich people make most of their money. It's taxed in the U.S. at 15%, while in Sweden it's subject to 30% tax. The more I looked at it, the more I began to see that a nation's tax structure is a reflection of its values. I asked Andreas Johansson the baker about something I often heard said in the U.S. Taxes are a form of theft, and it's my money, and I should be able to keep as much of it as I can. Thinking like that is like when you pee in your pants. It's warm and cozy for like some minutes, but after a while it, it starts to, to you getting cold and it's, it's smelly. To, to pay tax is to be an egoist. Because it's, uh, it's the only way for me as a, as a little, peep, little man to survive in this hard world. It's, it's the only security I have. It's, it's uh, to have a welfare state that I pay now, and when I need help, I can get help. So you're saying that it's in your self-interest to yeah. pay high taxes? Yes. Of course. Be because the money goes to schools, healthcare. We have one of the best healthcare systems in the world, after all. Uh, it goes to social security, unemployment. You get, uh, if you get permanently sick, you get an a package that helps you live even if you can't work because we help protect each other. This struck me as a practical way of thinking. Just how deeply rooted is practicality in the Swedish psyche? How do you eat a cupcake in Sweden? How do you eat a cupcake? <laughs> With a spoon. <laughs> you Swedes are so sensible. We are, aren't we? How do workers in Sweden deal with some of the very same issues facing hotel workers in Los Angeles? Sandra Victor, the LO Youth Secretary, begins by explaining that sector is among the least unionized in Sweden. In Stockholm, for example, within the hotel and restaurant workers union, only 25% are members within that specific union. Next, I described to her the hunger strike I'd witnessed at Disneyland. Do you ever do things like that here? No, because we have, I think, a different kind of uh, culture in uh, like uh, negotiating and uh, having this uh, 
regulated by collective agreements before it gets to that kind of big problem. We have this strong trade union with a lot of members that actually get to have good benefits through this collective agreement, so these things are not necessary. One hotel that I know, the workers have been without a contract for over a year and a half, some of them without a contract over two years. Does that kind of thing happen here? It's a duty for the employer, lay down in the law, to come to the negotiation table and try to find a solution. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can't just refuse to do that. Next, I asked Sandra Victor if Swedish hotels would consider using fitted sheets, which is such a contentious issue for U.S. hotel chains like Hyatt. Yes. Yes, I don't think that would be any problem. And I, I think that's already implemented in all the hotels in Sweden, actually. While U.S. business could learn from that Swedish example, there's a deeply distressing way Swedish business has begun following the American lead. Uh, Swedish labor market for, for hotel and restaurant workers are moving in an American way. We, we start to get working poor here in Sweden. You never had that before? No, we never, uh, not, not in the second half of the 20th century, I will say. No, now we have immigrant workers without papers in, in the hotel restaurant uh, sector and are really bad paid. This also is no accident. As Elenia points out, it was a political decision. This uh, law to make it easier for employees to get migrant workers, it press the wages down and down and down because we have, a, we have um, uh, workers working for worse conditions than we haven't seen for a long time here. And also for wages that, of course, compare with Maybe the Philippines or China or something are high, but compared with the Swedish collective agreements, they are maybe one third or something like that. How does the labor movement and how does your union position itself with respect to immigration? Is it seen as a threat? No, we welcome. We welcome them because uh, the, the only thing is say to the employer, they have to give them the same conditions as they give the Swedish workers. When I spoke with Håkan Juholt, then the head of the Social Democratic Party, he drew together several strands of the discussion into one unified way forward for Labour and its political allies. Migrant workers are arriving to Sweden with less payment than ordinary workers here in our country had the right to have. So we need to do severe investment to organize a labor market, the labor force that is the best investment in a welfare system. So we will never ever accept that uh, what you in US call uh, working poor, where you need to have one, two or maybe three jobs to survive, must be enough to have one job full paid so you can survive. Unsurprisingly, the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise takes a different view. Here, economist Lee Janssen asserts that weak unions and low wages are good for immigrants. If the unions would uh, uh, affect the labor market in a way that it's negative, for instance, pushing up the, the low minimum wages which we had done in, in Sweden and which of course affects the labor market really very badly for immigrants and young people and people who are disabled or have any other problem entering the labor market. It seemed an opportune time to ask an immigrant to Sweden for his perspective. Meet Johan Frick, a left-wing journalist and Social Democratic Party activist. For, for me it all started when I was uh, 15 years old and I was hunted by Nazis in Sweden and I was, uh, I was completely uh, um, not interested in politics. But when that happened I started asking questions. You were hunted yeah. by Nazis? That, 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 that's quite uh, normal in Sweden actually. What? Uh, for, for 20 years ago we had a very strong uh, na Nazi movement in Sweden. And by saying that I, I don't mean it was uh, millions but it, it was thousands of people. We had also uh, races in, in, the, in the parliament at that time, and we do have quite now also, but we, we had that for the first time since uh, the Second World War in the 90s. And then with that came this Nazi movement on the streets. Are and these they, the skinheads I've heard about? Yeah, the, the skinheads was in the 90s. Uh, and some people think that all Nazis disappeared uh, when the skinhead disappeared. But, they but their hair just grew back. Yeah, actually. So, uh, I, 
the last five years I've been attacked two, three times and they have killed I think 20 people in the last 20 years. Uh, when it's bad times in Sweden, they uh, are starting to look for uh, explanations. And um, the, the most simple explanation is, is uh, anti-immigrant. I couldn't help but to think of the U.S., where many researchers claim long-standing racism determined the stinginess of our own welfare state. I put to Johan a question, which I had earlier asked of Andreas and Peter. Do you think that, that if the uh, immigration question here in Sweden that, that is so controversial to so many people, that if that's not solved uh, re in a reasonable way, that it, that it threatens the achievements that you have made over the 20th century? Absolutely. No doubt about it. If we, if, if we start segregating people and saying, you are, less, you are of less value than us, then the whole democratic principle we have strived for for a hundred years in this country, it collapses. When you have uh, racism, uh, there are people who are, uh, who are making um, profit of that, uh, like the conservatives, actually. But when you have racism, people like the working class, they are, they are divided in, in uh, the, 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 the races say that the, the categories are Swedes and Sweden's people and the immigrants. And they, they like, like divide the, like the working class and all the society in, in two parts. And then uh, you are much smaller. It seemed only fair I seek out someone from the ultra-nationalist party to hear that side of the story. The Swedish population, sw Swedish-born Swedes, are, are in decline, a slow decline. Yeah. Uh, aren't immigrants necessary to maintain the, the tax system to keep the benefits up? Well, of course, uh, we need some immigrants. Um, and what we want to do is reduce immigration with 90%. So we don't want to take take it away, but we need to change the whole system. We need to uh, make sure that the people that are coming here get a, uh, become a part of the society as it is now. Since a lot of the people don't get into the society, uh, they're not helping at all. It's even worse than if we didn't take them because uh, they cost so much money, and that's a problem. Um, so. Hopefully, uh, we can encourage people to have more children instead. For one worker's final thoughts on the immigration question in Sweden, I turn to Andreas Johansson, the baker and member of the Food Workers Union. If we say, like, this, this, category, this category of people uh, is less worth, um, and we are fine about that, next time the category, the category of uh, overweight Swedish middle-aged men or less worth, yeah. then we will be like, <laughs> you're screwed. You're Suddenly, at an outdoor TV taping, I chanced to see the Reverend Jesse Jackson. When his taping was finished, I asked for his thoughts on how U.S. labor might make some of the same strides the Swedes had taken so long before us. Well, I think the labor unions must become more active. Mass action brings about mass change. Labor has been much too silent in the face of being diminished by policies that are so anti-labor. Labor's been good for America. I mean, uh, eight-hour workday, uh, workplace safety, uh, vacations, uh, security. Unions have been good for America, and the attacks upon labor is attack upon America's strength, which has been a strong, hard-working middle class. Politicians Week was ending, and I finished my stay in Visby by considering comments I'd heard from several people about how Swedish unions fit into the contemporary moment. It's a bit like religion, you know, a lot of people, it's easier to be, uh, it's easier to pray to God when something goes wrong than when you're just happy and thankful. So the same goes with the unions. It's easier to be a member of the union when the economy is bad and you're losing your job than when, you know, you're just thankful for a good system that they've helped create it. As long as we have a strong union, then we have the collective power to balance the scales between the employers and the employees. But if our side diminishes, then the system will collapse. And part of what would collapse would be the, uh, the universal welfare state that you have? Absolutely. It would be one of the first things to go, I think. Because it's based on, it's based on taxes, and the taxes come from happy workers who are at work because the unions are there protecting their interests. An explanation to the, the good working life in Sweden and the quite high salaries and quite very good of living is that we have strong trade unions because it makes, it makes the workers be able to, to make the working life better. It's one of the most important factors in shaping and forming the Swedish society. 
it is the biggest of the part of the civil society in Sweden are the trade unions. The it's biggest? The biggest one. Nearly all people are members of the trade unions. I mean the idea of the union that we, if we go together, if we use the strength from all of us, the collective strength, we can have a better situation for each one of our members. We could give them freedom, we could give them uh, uh, security, and we could give them power. Before I left the island, I found two voices who neatly encapsulated the two grand visions locked in competition since the dawn of human civilization. Ellen Melander, the left party student president, and Lee Janssen of the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise. Like Robin Hood, you take from the rich and give to the poor, and like we together build, we take in a lot of taxes and build a good society for everyone. Is it easy enough for Swedes to get rich? Can they get rich enough? No. I left Visby for the mainland, where I had two final Swedes to meet. In Stockholm, I ran into Trolls Muller, who handles corporate bankruptcies at a finance company. He's also a union member. We have it. We have it good here. I'm saying that, but of course people have it. You're paying a lot of taxes too, of course. But to see all your, those benefits you have here... Can I ask uh, which political party you belong to? Uh, liberal. Which would be uh, on the right in the United States, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Yeah. And someone on the right is telling me that high taxes, uh, you get you get your money's worth and it's it's good. Mm -hmm. I would say that, yeah. Before leaving the country, I spoke with Amanda Lundqvist, a barista and union member who has also attended college in the U.S. Wages are lower for that, for people in America, um, per hour, I think. I think we have a very high standard here. Are your wages here at the Espresso House uh, high enough for you to live on? Yes. I asked Amanda about the single thing I'd heard most often from hotel and restaurant employees in Los Angeles. Do you feel that you get that dignity and respect in the workplace? I do. Absolutely. With that, all my questions have been answered. I flew home where I found a surprising new force had arisen seeking to realign American politics. I celebrate the Occupy Wall Street movement that is actually exposing how the 1% has really completely dominated virtually every sphere of our lives and has corrupted the political system. We are one! We are one! On October 1st, 2011, Occupy Los Angeles sprang into being on the south lawn of City Hall. Um, I feel like there's too much, um, too much corporate influence in our democratic process. We can't even call it democratic anymore. I had long been wondering, where is the uprising from the left? Could this be it? It was joyful. It was talented. It was pithy and memorable. It was anarchic and colorful. I wondered if Occupy Los Angeles would have more staying power than the fizzling student protests I'd seen at Cal State Northridge. Also, how might Occupy LA make common cause with working people? The unions uh, have been trying to raise some of these issues by themselves for a number of years with no success to speak of. And now that some of these issues are being articulated by a genuinely spontaneous movement, uh, they have actually done a great deal to help this movement. Two weeks later, October 15, 2011, the AFL-CIO mobilized thousands of union members and others for a massive march and rally at Occupy LA. They got bailed out! We got sold out! It's happened in Greece! It's happened in Greece! It's happened in Spain! It's happened in Spain! It's happened in New York! It's happened in New York! And it's happening here! When such a small concentration of Americans controls such a large percentage of the wealth, inevitably people don't have jobs, can't pay back their student debt, because they don't even have access to the system that is supposed to be the American dream. In the two weeks since it began, the encampment had grown considerably. 
Meanwhile, at a rally beside City Hall, Maria Elena Durazo blended the voice of labor into the chorus of Occupy LA. We are not for our money being spent and wasted on killing people in Afghanistan. Bring our troops home. Use that money for us and our communities and our teachers. We'll send one message to that one percent. Without us, they're coming down. That same week, 60 Occupy LA protesters joined Unite here at a picket in front of the Hotel Bel Air. Standing at City Hall, I wondered how far this movement might go in opposing greed and the corporate control of government. The demographics of this country are changing rapidly and the corporate America is overreached for those reasons. And part of their overreach is they've captured both political parties. So for those reasons, the kinds of impulses that, that, that you see in the Occupy movement, I don't think there's any doubt they'll continue and, and grow. Since Occupy LA was driven out of City Hall Park by police in November 2011, it has multiplied and is now popping up all over. Here at the Hyatt Andaz, the Occupy-inspired, out-and-Occupy gay and lesbian organization joined with Unite Here Local 11 in February 2012 to give Hyatt the Valentine's Day gift of protest. Has there been any change since last time I saw you in the summer? No, no, the, the, comp the company is still being very bullish and uh, they're just acting like spoiled little children. How much money do billionaires need, you know? They can share the wealth. Still, the Hyatt campaign had taken a turn toward the legal system. February 21st of this year, we have a trial before the National Labor Relations Board. There are two cases against the Hyatt, filed by the union and the housekeepers here at the Hyatt on Dog. So this was really something for even the NLRB to say, okay, they have violated the law and you have a case, we'll have a formal trial. Occupy LA came to an action that we had about six months ago at the Hotel Bel Air, you know, they endorsed that action. I think that when we go, when we take workers, we go down to um, talk to occupiers, they they get it that uh, their struggle is our struggle and we should unite and work together. Fair wages, safe conditions, and respect for all workers are important, are important to gay and lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. Now that the movement is no longer uh, sleeping out in the park, uh, down at City Hall, is it harder for you to maintain links with them? I think organizing is hard, no matter how you do it. It takes a lot of work and a lot of people involved. How will we sleep in peace if we know the money we pay to hotels has been stolen, stolen from the health and safety and wages of working people? We'll be back! We'll be back! We'll be back! The Hyatt housekeepers will have to be back. As of April 2012, their dispute still has not been settled. However, at the same Hyatt protest, I received important news about the Disneyland struggle. Yeah, in December, after you know a really tough, uh, nearly four-year struggle, more than 2,000 Disney hotel workers settled uh, a fair deal with the company. Um, it was a really tough, really long fight, um, but you know they were really proud about proud at the contract they won at the end. Um, workers won a raise. They won. Uh, the very important affordable health care, an option to keep uh, their union health insurance that at a very affordable rate. They want better conditions for housekeeping, job security, job protections for um, uh, for servers and other workers who, who were sort of possibly at risk of going to part-time. Um, so we want a lot and we're really proud. The contract is five years. Uh, the workers clearly feel great about it, uh, not only by their vote but by the amount of celebration that accompanied the, uh, the meetings where the workers uh, voted on it. The result was a compromise. It's not like the workers won everything. But it was a compromise that protected uh, the health care for the present workforce and in particular the present and future employees protected the full-time work week. That's really the key to it. We have seen the power of workers when they come together they are an unstoppable force. The Hyatt workers struggle on in picket lines and now in court appearances. And the outcome of that campaign is far from certain. The success of the Disneyland campaign, though, has had tangible benefits for 2,100 workers and their families, many of whom I met over these past two years. Should she need them, Jorge's daughter can get glasses. If Eddie's son breaks his arm, he can get it fixed. Little Julissa can have her cavities filled after eating all that sugar. But is there more? When they have the experience of being able to improve their lives through collective action, 
I think that it uh, uh, gives working people uh, a much greater confidence that uh, it's actually possible to have a fair and just society. 2012 marks the 100th anniversary of the Lawrence, Massachusetts strike, uh, known as the Bread and Roses strike. And even 100 years ago, workers said, we want bread, but we want roses too. That it is not enough just to fight for economic benefits, but that unions are fighting for a better life, a better world. With the new contract, 2,100 families are more economically secure and more healthy. And the community around Disneyland just got a little more equal. Societies that are more equal have lower infant mortality, less teen pregnancy, less mental illness, less alcoholism and drug addiction, less murder and less incarceration. They also have higher educational achievement for children, higher social mobility, greater trust among people, and longer life expectancy. In Sweden, which performs dramatically better than the U.S. across all the categories I just named, the improvements don't just go to low-income people. Even the rich have better outcomes when society is more equal. I had spent two years following working people and their intersections with social movements and with like-minded legislators. As I saw in Sweden, the only hope of opposing total corporate supremacy is a massive movement from the outside and progressive lawmakers on the inside. In other words, an uprising of democracy. We will not be silent! We will not be silent! In standing up to corporate power, these Los Angeles hotel workers aren't just fighting for themselves or even just for their non-union comrades who suffer much worse treatment for even less pay. These low-wage, mostly immigrant workers are fighting through their labor union to create a society that is more equal, more fair, more just for all of us. Unions foster a better world for everyone. <laughs> Politicians feeding off of each other's needs, feeling suspicious. Where is the America that we?